All right, so it's uh, April 23rd, 2018. We're in Greenfield, Massachusetts. Uh, could you say your name? Andrea Cohen Kiner. Uh, okay, so Andrea, the, our first question is, how did you end up being a rabbi in Western Massachusetts? What's the story behind how you got here in the first place? Mm -hmm. So how I got to be a rabbi and how I got to be in Massachusetts. I'm going to do both, but I'll yeah, do it in yeah. a like. terse enough way. Um, feminism and Judaism and progressivism um, hit the campus in Minnesota where I was growing up in the 70s. The 60s got to Minnesota in the 70s because of, you know, the distance. And uh, so all those things kind of imprinted my identity and I um, went into Jewish education because that was a way to do leadership whereas the rabbinate was closed in most of the movements at that time. Just changing a little bit. And uh, so I stayed in work like that, Jewish, Jewish administrative work and values education and so on. And then I ordained when that became possible after really having a family. I mean, well, I was working part-time and raising kids and uh, getting my studies in. So I ordained as an adult. And how I got to New England is, um, you know, I followed my ex-husband from uh, the Midwest out to the East, and um, he got a permanent position at Trinity College in Hartford. And uh, when we separated and divorced, I had wanted to just try a more ecological lifestyle. And so I did some research about uh, living rurally and then made a decision to do that. And then um, I was just living on a farm for a while, and then I, I decided not to retire from Judaism. So I sought rabbinical work in a farming area mm -hmm. and uh, was told of a job here. I applied here and accepted it. It's good. We're still, it's year three. We're still on our honeymoon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've had fights, but it's been going all right. Mm -hmm. To be expected, I guess, <laughs> um, given that joke we just heard. So um, could you maybe just say a little bit, I'm just interested in the, the ordination oh, yeah. part. Like, Is that uh, what, interesting? Yeah. yeah. What, yeah. How, did, how did that take shape? I know that has no Western Mass. Yeah, well, being as the house was a uh, household was two professionals, myself and a, a Jewish educator, and then a professor in, in Jewish studies. We had all the resource materials in the house. I had academic training. Mm -hmm. I went into a program which is an adult ed model. There's several of them, and um, it's a little more art than science. And um, I was a fairly early graduate of that program, and uh, that the training in that for me was in uh, Hasidism, sort of updated, like updated to include sort of like physics and feminism and then other religions having something to add to the mm -hmm. DNA of human consciousness. Those are some of the key features of uh, the approach that we take in Jewish Renewal, as the movement is called. Um, so it's a depth psychology and a depth cosmology, very appealing to me, very interesting, inclusive yet the unique strands of each contribution. And so on. So that's that's a good denomination for me, and uh, so I joined in that movement, which was we spent the summers together, and then during the year I had to like um, I called it learn and earn. So when I had to like really nail biblical literature, like that couple year period where that was really on my curriculum, I went to teach in the yeshiva. I already kind of had the tools to go in and mm -hmm. teach Chumash with Rashi for a couple of years up mm -hmm. at the Grinspoon Academy in Springfield mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. Long Meadow. Mm -hmm. And that was my university of learning and earning. Mm -hmm. And then I did rituals with the guidance of my rabbinic committee. And then I was, I was actually, I'll just add this, I was ordained as a um, Mora Mashpia, which is more like, a, what's a Mashpia? Like a counselor, a reverend, I think he called it reverend, mm -hmm. by Reb Zalman, because we both got cancer the same year. Mm. And I wasn't done with my program yet, and I wanted a Yerusha from him. I wanted a, a lineage from mm -hmm. him. So he gave me um, a smicha, is what I was ready for at that time, to mm -hmm. learn and teach and influence and lead and worship and all, you know, whatever mm -hmm. you could say there. So, and then we both lived to... Um, participate in my full ordination oh, and, and somewhat after that yeah great that he was yeah present for that yeah 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 so I had some good colleagues too Michael Lerner's a colleague he was ordained that same weekend as I got my other uh -huh. ordination my uh -huh. smaller one we were just talking about him yesterday yeah um all right now you mentioned uh that you had were developing these interests in a more ecological mm. way to live and then you've 
found yourself this opportunity to serve as a rabbi to what you call a farming, a more farming community. So my next question has to do with the sort of the uniqueness, the idiosyncrasies that points a distinction of being a rabbi in a place like this, in, in a town like Greenfield, in a community like the Western Massachusetts, and uh -huh. um, what what are you learning about that? What <laughs> what's important about that? What makes it uh -huh. different um, from <laughs> your sense of what being a rabbi elsewhere might be like? Yeah, it's funny you say that because as even as you're asking the question, I'm thinking about there are some things that are really distinct about the rural aspect, just the rural urban aspect of it, and then there are a lot of things that are really distinct by your specific genealogy, your specific demographics in your area, your specific like large institutions, influencers, other cultural and economic influencers in an area that make, let's say Brattleboro, you know, even unique from what we have here. And then Keene again, but you know, if I'm objective, see we're different than Amherst. We're really different than Amherst and that might fall in a different category where there would start to be yeah, but it's still the same. It's still your cult, your big cultural drivers are going to influence what's going so, on so, there. So, I mean, I, I know what you mean uh -huh. about different from Amherst. Yeah, yeah. But I want you to tell me. I want really you to say, say the what? Like, what? Yeah, I know, I know. Now I'm giving the yeah, frame. Yeah. And so now I'm going to just go right yeah, into Greenfield. Yeah. So what happens here in Greenfield is that it is a um, county center. So it has a lot of like municipal. Um, economic drivers in a certain way like we have a big prison here with a federal aspect and so forth and the town is sort of operating on a lot of these grants that came in after the mills were depleting and stuff like that so but meanwhile what also is here as an economic driver partly because of that and the history of that and the transportation and every and the geography is that it's it continues to be an agricultural center even where some of the factory work has died off so it has that feeling of a center so it has a little bit of a little bit of urban buzz. It has urban problems. It has actually been overrepresented in urban problems, like some other town centers. Especially one of my friends says border towns, border towns near to state edges, tend to populate more of a need population relative to their size. I was very struck by that when I came here to the extent that I looked up the demographics to see why it seemed like that to me. And that was borne out when I got to the demographics. It was quite interesting. Mm -hmm. So anyways, okay, so there's that aspect. And uh, so those are some of the jobs. And then, but it's a farming area, so that is really wonderful. And uh, that has a good effect for me as a rabbi and a kind of a bad effect for me as a rabbi. The good effect is that the people have fantastic values the way that I look at Judaism as, uh, and the, it's hard to read the Bible this way, it really is. You have to really look to try to read the Bible this way. Like, go and look in Deuteronomy, some of the pastoral descriptions in there. That is all about farming. It's about the Shema prayer that we say every single day mentions two different kinds of rainfall. <laughs> You know what I mean? And uh, the crops and the settling and the land and the cycles and the sustaining of all that and the kind of economy that it generates and the kind of sharing and social leveling institutions that are generated in an agrarian economy. No one gets really rich and everyone needs everyone. If you're really rich but you're mean to your workers, why there's laws in the Torah about that. <laughs> You know? So and so, those kind of values that permeate a rural environment are, I appreciate them. Kind of fleeing a small city environment. We could talk about that if you want to, like where I grew up and stuff. Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. How would you call that? That's a city, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's different. But so that was uh, my core environment. Um, yeah. So I really appreciate those uh, land-based values, and that's why I wanted to live here because of the intelligence and the modesty and the culture that comes here. Now, you know, having to do with environmental concerns, actually, you know, at the end of the day, this is an activism. It's an activism to participate in the food system. That's how I am mm -hmm. at this stage of my life. That's my. That's one of my points. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing that's hard about it is also very. Uh, you know, sensible, if you think about it, is that people aren't moving here for the Judaism. 
So they're coming up here because there's a uh, Buddhist place nearby that they really love, or they got land and they love the land around here. And uh, only one of the wives is Jewish or, you know, various permutations of that. And so people are really, really more spread out and they're, in a way their identities are more diffuse, diffuse, you know, to a normal extent having to do with their radiation, like where they live close to. So Wendell has a strong cultural center in Shelburne and so on. And so, how, what are the strands, where can I pick up the strands to make uh, a social fabric out of the individuals that, what do they need? How can our culture help them? I really do believe that you should affiliate with things that help you do what you want to do. <laughs> so here that might include like chanting and meditating or learning Hebrew or studying history from some perspective or some kind of cultural exchange or something like that. So that's where I find those strands, where I can find a few people that come together. Now we're wandering off of the question, we're wandering into how do you work with uh, that aspect of um, a farming community. Yeah, you've got to be your own cultural creative center around here. And it takes a while to find the partnerships. That's another challenge because people really are spread out. Mm -hmm. It takes longer for relationships to grow. Well, I would have thought, um, and maybe I'm just sort of extrapolating a little bit and I'm also sort of supplying stuff from interviews that I did years ago with other people in communities like this, that a small town synagogue also presents the challenge of widely varying levels of observance. Yeah. Right? I mean, how, that uh, must affect you here. Maybe you could talk about yeah. that, that you have people who lean towards orthodoxy and you have people who lean towards reform and you have people uh, who are like off of those charts. So <laughs> We had them all. Mm -hmm. You know, at the end of the day, it's a, t it's a ridiculous challenge, but I think it's a gigantic plus. You have to just go into it and say that. You have to go in and say it. And you have to go in and say, we're going to do our chant, and we're going to sit in silence now because it's a second Shabbat, so we're having our creative service. And Michael's going to sit over here, not you, and he's going to kind of mumbo-jumbo. He's going to be davening and making his intention be a quiet sound of another soul sort of praying in their way that suits them better. And you just have to name it ever, you know. So what we do is we, we just say that at the beginning and on purpose I try to do like we're having one Shabbat that's a family dinner because that's a lot of fun. That's a great thing about Shabbat to sit at the dinner table together. And one is a creative service and that's to get in our pagans and our Buddhists and our, I, I like chanting, like a, you know, quiet, periods of quiet and a service and musical instruments and stuff. And we have a traditional Friday, a traditional Saturday. On paper, depends who shows up. So here I was last Friday to have a traditional Shabbat, and who shows up? Some people from Brattleboro. Maybe they were in a synagogue like 15 years ago, you know, with a black child and really interested in an adoptive family, interested in uh, people of color, you know, representation. Could they be comfortable here? Not a word of Hebrew from one of them. One of them kind of went to summer camp. So we didn't have our traditional service, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in other words, because you wanted to accommodate... There were four their, their people presence. at the yeah. service. Yeah. This is them. That, that's who they were. Yeah. Right. And, and that was hard for me at first because I prepared and then I felt disappointed. And I felt like, oh, I'm not offering the right thing and they're not coming to stuff. And I love davening. I've written a book about davening. I mean, I, like I've, I literally have written a book about davening education, actually, which uh, I don't think I need to translate that. But anyways. Um, but... And then the other thing, this is a really important thing, and this is everywhere, by the way. People don't know what prayer is. That's the other blockage. So even people that are going like, I really think there should be more English poetry, and why can't you do the familiar ones, which means the ones that they know. So that's obviously impossible to scratch that itch for everybody. Um, but on the other hand, understanding states of prayer and understanding what intentional uh, directing the mind and the heart in certain ways, opening, I would call them fields. That's something, it's a more subtle experience. I think we all have natural experiences of prayer and elevation and so forth. Scant words for them, scant contextualization for them. And so I feel like 
three years into it, starting out really one of my hardest things, all that planning and all that disappointment, one of the factors is that in the groups, in the groups, whatever the style of the worship is, if people are directing, getting a little richer in their inner direction, in their vocabulary, in their experience base about worshipful states. And so it's, I feel like I've been able to add a little leavening to the overall vocabulary mm -hmm. about spiritual work, either through classes and, you know, everything mm -hmm. should feed into everything, right? The Torah learning should feed into the services and the services should feed into the pastoral care. Trust me, if more people came to Dove and more, I would have less people on the couch because the support of a group and the loving support and the stating things that are important and sharing important emotional truths in a ritual in a supportive environment that's good for us replaces an hour of session mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i'm serious i tell people that you know you should come to services and you'll save you an hour <laughs> <laughs> so people try there's a yeah. you know we're wounded about prayer it's a terrible thing mm -hmm. if you had a bad experience it's just boring it's either boring or uh, threatening or infantilizing that's another one <laughs> mm -hmm. what do you think about that or is this my interview <laughs> oh, um, what do I think about? Uh, yeah, the material for, you know, that kind of development. I, I, I'm, I personally, I feel like I'm on, I'm on the outside of it uh -huh. because um, prayer was not part of my growing up. Uh -huh. and, yeah, just uh, not part. It, it, and, but I, I have a high opinion of prayer. Like I, I think it's great. Uh -huh. you know? It's not something that I find myself lapsing into. Although, uh -huh. I mean, if you have a very generous definition of prayer, maybe I do. Sure, sure. But um, yeah, I don't know. I'm still working that. I'm still yeah. working that. That's way. more the question. What yeah. you know? I would say quieting is a form of prayer. Yeah. Sitting is definitely a form of prayer. Intending. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. that that'd be a conversation to have. Yeah. yeah. Do you ever come to Purim? Purim, you get drunk a little bit. You believe in God. Uh, I've come to Purim at this place. <laughs> Purim is so much time. fun. Yeah. And I, oh. I, but I exited before things oh, were getting no. really out of hand. Oh, no. <laughs> I didn't want to see that. Oh, really um, out of hand. Was it bad? No, I'm just kidding. We do theater. We try to do theater here. Yeah, no, I've been I've been here for a couple of the. Purim yeah, shows. they're fact, fun, right? I've been. I think I was recruited into one or two of them. Well, so. um, you're going on my list for next year. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So uh, this is, uh, I guess, an adjunct of the small town uh -huh. question, the Western Massachusetts question, the Greenfield question it has to do with, um, I assume maybe wrongly, but uh, that that as the rabbi of the one Jewish congregation in town, uh -huh. you have some or you try to have some relationship with other religious denominations yeah. in town. Uh, what's that like? Can you talk about it? I, uh -huh. I remember, I think I went with Ephraim once to the Interfaith Council. Yeah. Uh, so I was aware, at least in his time, that there's such a thing existed. But maybe you could talk about that. A yeah. Bit. Well, the thing is, some of the sociologies that affect our congregation also affect um, the Lutherans and the Congregationals and the Episcopals. A few of those are full-time. The Catholics are full time. I believe the Episcopal is full time. You mean full time, like they have a, have a, a full clergy time person. clergy yeah. person working yeah. there. A lot of us are like twenty to thirty hour range, and that's really common. Or shared congregations or stuff like that. So everyone's a little busy. Um, I go to the interfaith group um, because really because the temple uh, wrote it in my contract that they want me to have a hand in the social justice. Uh, you know, effects here, and that seemed like a good way to network. But most of us are not active clergy. I mean, I might be the only one actually. There's one a retired, mm. and a couple of reps, representatives, and a, couple, a campus minister, two campus people, and one uh, hospice person. Because their schedule facilitates it, allows it. So, uh, but I think it's important to go because I, I mean, we have a pagan on board also again, but. Uh, it's, I felt responsible to be part of it. And I think the diversity is important for them, mm -hmm. and I think the relationships are important for me. So I am in a relationship with, with that group. Um, I've also worked, uh, is that, I mean, I could say I've also, like I consulted with a jail that was actually really interesting. Mm -hmm. They had a case where they wanted 
information about accommodating a kosher, a person who was mm-hmm. requesting kosher food. And that was really complicated and interesting. It was actually a Muslim person uh-huh. who was requesting kosher just to kind of be a jerk in a way. It was kind of interesting. I had to be really hard with the guy and just say that you're just making stuff up to bother the kitchen people. Mm-hmm. And uh, they like me over there. <laughs> I, I, told, I told him, write this in your report that you made reasonable accommodations. Uh-huh. And he refused to identify a halal authority. And he just was feeding him a lot of bullshit. I mean, they were trying to accommodate him. So I said, write that huh. down, write that you've made reasonable. Huh. The rabbi said you made reasonable accommodations. Huh. <laughs> right? So, but there's but other institutions like the Green and Greenfield people and the, you know, there's a lot of that up here. That's why I came mm-hmm. up here. You could do whatever you want. You could learn how to keep bees and do yeah. native shrubs and everything. Yeah. So those are some of, I stay active in those areas uh-huh. in my recreational time uh-huh. or my like non-professional activist time now do you f- have you found yourself do you find yourself called upon to be not that this would be easy or fair uh but do you find yourself expected to be sort of the the, the voice of the jewish community in this predominantly non-jewish town <sighs> That's one, of, that, that's one of my most hated activities. I, I bet it is, but I want to hear about re- it. Represent bit. something yeah. else. Yeah, so. Or even use the R in front of my name. There's a big authority in that. I really have to watch it. Um, usually I try to speak in a way that upholds a kind of a principle and a kind of an approach mm-hmm. rather than a position. And that's usually pretty safe to talk in that way. And when people kind of ask me to make a, pos- a position a certain way, I will often re- kind of just reflect it back to them and and say that, you know, our, our power rests on all of us. It's not, I really cannot talk for. I will probably say that as often as anything else. Mm-hmm. I cannot talk for. I can tell you oh, I'm thinking about it. Because it's really not any kind of role to have. I don't think that you can do it. I mean... Certainly, I feel sometimes like I have to show up because be, I, it's more about showing up. Well, I, I wonder, have, have, has there has anything specific come up mm-hmm. in town? I mean, mm-hmm. I know there were some... Oh, something else to say that you're going to... I don't remember. I, I just remember attending a, a vigil yeah. a year or so ago where there were acts of some awful harassment of an African-American uh-huh. woman in town. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, right. And I wonder if similar stuff has come up. Uh, uh, with respect to the Jewish, I mean, I know it has. Well, I'm going to tell you something. It's actually kind of personal, but it addresses yeah. what you're talking yeah. about, which is when I was a rabbi in Hartford, I led a chavura, which we just met one Shabbat a month, and then maybe classes here and there. And uh, I was the little rabbi that met in the like the social hall of a congregational place, and then now I came up here. Now I'm the big rabbi. And I had to learn about that. I had to, it took me a while, uh, probably I'm still learning, but um, in a way I had to, in a non-egomaniacal way, I had to open the aperture that allowed esteem to come in so that I could, with the right amount of humility and gravitas, bless the opening of the justice center you know, to do functionary Uh things like that. And so that an aspect of that power and using it fairly and not to manipulate people, of course, I'm aware of rabbis everywhere have power and, you know, and that to abuse in social situations if they will it. And Mm. I'm kind of trained to be aware of that. But this was another level where that representative thing was more, just more visible, just more part of the shape of the job in a way Mm -hmm. up here in a small town. (laughs) <laughs> in Hartford, they have a whole other Jewish organization with multiple staff members mm-hmm. to respond to anti-Semitic incidents. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Here, I'm going to get that call. <laughs> mm-hmm. So has it happened in Oh, your well, tenure? you know, we hear, yeah, we hear stuff. I mean, we had some incidents here. And the incidents we had here and the incidents that we were trained about in my tenure were actually by, by Jewish people, unhealthy Jewish people. Mm. So, you know, that's a phenomenon of our uh-huh. yeah. time. Go we'll study that. But yeah. we've had, you know, we had swastikas, and I'm putting these pictures back up now that my walls are painted, of the rally where people came out to hold candles mm-hmm. after swastikas were painted. You know, it's happening up at Deerfield right now, Academy, and a lot of colleges. There's been a sustained, you know, anti-Semitic sort of, just literally people ha- printing off posters, actually just leaving them in the printers or posting mm-hmm. them around. 
kind of random, but you know, it's that's rearing its ugly head. It's in the environment, so mm-hmm. we have to deal with it in that yeah. way. But I try to not have that possibility. I try to have due diligence as an American citizen, not just a Jewish citizen, mm-hmm. and so mm-hmm. we're all vulnerable. Mm-hmm. But not to have that fear as a part of my identity mm-hmm. publicly either. Mm-hmm. Right. It comes up for me. And then, then we got to talk about it. We got to talk about it to each other, process that. Mm-hmm. So we do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to slightly switch gears and ask now about um, from whom do you seek spiritual counsel, <laughs> right? I think, in fact, I've heard maybe it was you, maybe it was somebody else, you know, some rabbi saying, my rabbi said, you know, like every rabbi has their rabbi. So where, where is that for you? Where, who is that? Where are those people? Who are those yeah, people? Yeah, that's a really lovely question. And it, it was a, a different part of the um, rural life that you could uh, get up here because in some ways my colleagues and support around here is the Interfaith Council because there I can talk to them about group relations and what I'm trying to do and how mm. it's perceived. So the professional colleagues up here is, is that little network, you know, and for everything else, it would really and truly, I'll see how the topic develops, but do I want to start saying that it really depends on the issue. So if I had a kosher question, I have and I would call Rabbi Yitzchak Adler, who runs the nearest, uh, well, that one that I know, the Hartford Kosher Commission, he has an Orthodox standard. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of other friends and associates that uh, I would bring certain kinds of um, questions to. Um, I guess uh, Rabbi Shafa Gold might be a person that I would consult for personal developmental issues. Like mm-hmm. um, I had a phenomenon after prayer that was um, hard to identify, and I wanted to talk to her about that. It was mm-hmm. something about digesting the impact of creating a really big energy field it makes you get kind of blown out Mm -hmm. (laughs) and you might feel that expansiveness for a couple days it's a little intense you know and just talk to her about some of the craft of that so that's that's an important Mm -hmm. you know rabbinic thing in a way um counseling and stuff like this you know it depends it all depends i had uh i had a foster child for a while and i'm pretty good at dealing with personality disorders and i've done a pretty good job of um, bringing a healthier communication culture to Temple Israel. So I'm considered a source on that. And then I have other mm-hmm. colleagues that I study with. I will mention one other guy. I'm not sure this is in your purview of questions, but they're the Rebbe, one of the Rebbe's of the Warsaw Ghetto, Kalanimus Shapira, is an influencer for me. I read his texts three hours a week with groups mm-hmm. and um, as a volunteer and no, I'm teaching him a little bit with a friend of mine, mm-hmm. Natan. So there's a whole group of people of, that study him, and there's some of my advisors now, too. Mm-hmm. This is like a peer group. Uh, Look, you know, you're all to, looking yeah. to a, a, a single person's text, but the, the group of you are doing it together. Exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. He's a very erudite soul, a very oh. elevated soul. He was teaching, this man was teaching meditation in the Warsaw Ghetto. We mm-hmm. have written records of that. Yeah. He was writing books in there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So he's like, Psh, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, now, this question is apropos of the event that happened the other night, and uh, the event that you, where you hosted me as a speaker. Yeah. The bigger question is, um, what's it been like to uh, talk about Israel? Uh-huh. To and you have a, there's an Israel dialogue project, which is not just you, right? It's oh it's no, larger, I joined it. I joined the group. It's when a I got larger there. pre-existing. Yeah, it's a but, pre-existing. Um, for Jewish congregations in 2018, that's a big issue, and that's an important thing for people looking at the historical record to hear about. So maybe you could talk about that. Yeah, it's bit. unbelievable, right? Yeah. It's like the hardest topic right now, right? You know, people in my age group here are like glued to the transistor radio on the miracle of the Seven Day War. I mean, we were just glued to that. We were definitely David. And now there's a question, we might be Goliath. Mm -hmm. And so where does a progressive Jew go with that? And holding the conflict to that, that has split our community in deep, important ways. Really, not much more, you know, complicated than that in a certain way. Um, I'm sorry, but... When you say split our community, I mean I conceptually I get uh-huh, that, uh-huh. but can you 
can you sort of I make that, say more that concrete another more, for okay. me? So no, I just people, want to hear like what 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 does that mean exactly? That people we split? people who love and value and identify with Judaism from all different points of view. Um, have their own things that they value about Judaism, and uh, because of that and who they are and everything else, everything else, um, that gets mixed in with their approach to Israel. So, um, and it's not one thing. I mean, you have people coming out of the Holocaust that are some of the most progressive peace camp people and the opposite of that. And um, it's not one combination. So people like Jewish Voices for Peace, which are, what do they say? They're anti-Zionist? Do they say that? They're, they don't say they're anti-Zionist. They say they're anti-occupation. So occupation becomes like, you know, are we even going to use that word? Are we occupying another people or are we defending ourselves, which we've been trying to do since 46 and all the centuries before that, you know, that type mm -hmm. of thing. Uh, what's right? What's Jewish? What has value? What's important? Do we want to survive as a people? Some in the peace camp talk about surviving morally and ethically in our values and stuff so that being an occupier is a deep challenge to being a value-based Jew. That's that's another way of saying that mm -hmm. internal split because people love Judaism and claim it mm -hmm. and it brings them to different positions about um, different things having to do, you know, we're all over the map with the solutions. But in this be. in this community, mm -hmm. you say this community has been or has been split by this Let's issue. go back. What does that look like? Let's go back. Let's yeah. go back. Yeah, yeah, some of this preceded me. Okay, so I'm going to be just blunt here, okay? Yeah. So no, now you have all those complexities of identity right. and affiliation and so forth. And then you have the issue of personality disorders. So you have people showing up or from a more uh, protectionist uh, position or even militant or just something in that mm -hmm. range. And even people from the more peace camp, obviously, also really getting all out of bounds and basically shutting down conversations with their vociferousness, be that as it may. So there was someone here maybe 20 years ago, was active here just a little bit more than 20 years ago, who was very vociferous in that way and just, just would do crazy things like showing up with, uh, I don't know, like, you know, newspaper articles, like, like pictures of Nazi you know, victims and ju just being very vociferous in that way. And just people were afraid to talk. That's when the Israel Dialogue Project formed because they were chased away. They wanted to have a conversation that included more points of view. Mm -hmm. That was their main thing. Mm -hmm. So they actually disassociated from the temple for a period of time when, when the conversation got too hot and they mm -hmm. just kept their own thing going separately. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so now that person now that I'm talking about right now is a dear friend of mine. And we've had that conversation. Mm -hmm. If I had been here in that period, it would have destroyed my ministry. I'm not sure I would have been skilled enough to really mm -hmm. handle that conversation. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. I have the tools and the strength to separate the personality disorder from the position and deal with them both separately. So one would be sort of pastoral and limit setting in public dialogue mm -hmm. and enforcing that. Mm -hmm. And I have the strength and the skill to do that. No, I mm -hmm. wouldn't have had it back then. It would have been. It would have given me an ulcer for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, you know a little bit about my position. You know, uh, there's there's a lot of feeling about it too. So that sometimes really colors how we listen and how mm -hmm. we react to people that we love but we disagree with. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that really comes as like a really sudden and sharp obstacle mm -hmm. in a relationship. That's very sad too. Mm -hmm. But basically I believe in humanizing both sides. So it's much less about a position. Even we had combatants for peace here last night and they basically said the same thing that actually, you know what they said and it's one of the tenets of their program, the first thing they do when they get together is confess. Mm -hmm. And that they, they refuse and they have political opinions, but when they're speaking for the organization, they refuse to identify them and they say, we think the thing we need to do now is trust building. Have you seen mm -hmm. that movie? Well, yeah, we were here that night. Oh, you were here that night. I had was to that leave amazing? before the uh, the actual speakers, which yeah. is what I was. Shoot, you should have come for the breakfast. Did you know about the breakfast? Oh, no, you didn't? no, shoot. Uh, oh, well. It was a donor thing. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's why yeah. we should. So it was by invitation, but yeah. I, I didn't know if you'd want to come. Actually, I mean, I I, I, I thought about it and I thought. I don't know if my quads would pay fifty bucks for this. It was it's well, an ask. Uh, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> oh, the different thing. Yeah. But yeah. Um, but yeah, we saw 
So yeah. I think I assume it was. Probably I'm going to show it again. I'll invite you when yeah. we do it. It's yeah, it's thanks. a it's a terrific film. Powerful. Yeah. Um, we're getting to the the uh, so the bigger final questions. Okay. Well, I'm going to reverse the order of these. You said you you had a sense of um, the last forty years. Yeah. There. So how if somebody asked you, so what's Temple Israel? What's this? What's this, the story of Temple Israel over the last forty years? What is that story? Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So they had. Um, I I can't. I don't know who came before Louis uh, Reiser. Reiser. Uh, so that maybe is like 35 years. They had a, I know that they floated from orthodox to conservative to unaffiliated. I know, I know that happened through the 70s and so forth. I know that the building is, the, the old sanctuary is about 100 years old. And it was, it looks like a congregational type of church. Mm-hmm. And in, in the 70s and 80s, or maybe it was after that, more like then. Well, somewhere in there, in the 80s, I guess, they built this wing, maybe 82. They built this wing, the school wing. There's six classrooms in there. They're all this size. They had a gigantic school. It was huge. And that was a generation after the first rural settlement and then those guys that went into World War II and stuff like that. That was them Mm -hmm. raising their kids and coming here and having a big Hebrew school. It was a certain generational thing. Second, mostly second generation Mm -hmm. Americans. Uh, coming up here for you know rural work. I mean, there were a lot of Jews in farming. You do know mm-hmm. that. You do. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I won't go into that. I know a little more about it now. But anyway, so that was the heyday, I guess. And a lot of those members are still around. They're older now. Yeah. And then and then our original clapstone building burnt down, and they rebuilt the sanctuary. So that's that's the physical history of it, the rabbinic history of it. Um, under Lewis, it was conservative, and the, he was here for the big school, and they rebuilt that at that time. Um, what else? Then it came down to Ephraim, and Ephraim is um, Jewish renewal ordained, so they slipped out of the... Our, when I got here, their Hebrew school had like s- six kids in there, ages, what, like four to ten? Six kids? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because uh, Rabbi Ephraim was uh, really popular with young families, and uh, he still is doing very skilled bar mitzvah education. And um, I actually think that it was just, he wasn't as good as at, at handling some of the controversies that arose about all sorts of things. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so there started to be resentment and grief and recrimination on both sides, and and so forth and it was it really soured at the end it was quite Mm -hmm. uh hard and a lot of the younger families left and you know some of them went to jca and stayed gone a lot Mm -hmm. of them did and um so the school was very very uh small at that time and they took an interim period after the ephraim years and then they hired me and so i want to they they had before me i'll just say that maybe this goes back 12 years they had things that happened to a lot of nonprofit organizations but that are kind of serious traumas, and they happened right in a row in a 12 year period. Mm-hmm. So, one of, I mean, I, the, the only one that comes to mind, I'll just to inform you, Mark, was the, I knew her, the, what is it, secretary, the, the yeah, person office who, manager, office very manager, trusted. embezzled a couple hundred thousand yeah. dollars. Not just from us. From this but, tiny, yeah, this yeah. tiny little, yeah. So. Ridiculous, right? Over a period of years yeah. and so forth. So that tells you what kind of oversight and whatever was going on here. There was plenty of conflict. And then um, I think Ephraim leaving under such um, bitter circumstances was another very serious trauma. Mm-hmm. And before that, they had a rabbi who was very beloved. He was serving as a rabbi. And uh, his wife became, uh, a, you know, in a, what's the opposite of acute, uh, where she was declining slowly, debilitating mm-hmm. uh, prognosis. And he basically left his wife with a congregant. Um, so that that was also divisive because people really loved him, and they didn't. Mm-hmm. Even the people that wanted to fire him loved him. Mm-hmm. And so I'm sure that was a little traumatic as well. And so here, my good, compassionate listening skills. All my skills were very, very helpful. Which I I asked them about money when I came here because I know that's an issue and I said if I move here are you going to be able to pay me for three years who pays the dues here it's a small congregation it's dilapidated right now it was in rough shape really and they told me they had really good financial oversight and that was true but it wasn't the whole truth because the whole truth is they put it in place 
because they had this trauma. Mm -hmm. And so I walked into more minefields than I knew about. I knew about the Ephraim minefields. Mm -hmm. I didn't know about the other ones. Mm -hmm. Me neither. I didn't know about that. (laughs) Yeah, I didn't know about the financial stuff. Well, I mean, I knew about the, the... the, the person who stole all the yeah, money, yeah, but yeah. I didn't know that there, that the the good financial Management. oversight uh-huh. was a result of I, I, yeah. Oh it yeah. Makes sense. Oh yes, sense of course, of course. Way it came in afterwards. Yeah, yeah thank mm-hmm. God. Right. Yeah. The other thing I did, I'll just I don't know if this is not relevant historically, but the first thing I did when I got here was like throw things out. We had a lot of we had a really lot of like, maybe we'll need seventy copies of the handmade. 17 page Haggadah for children again next year and we have several different sets of 70 mm-hmm. <laughs> of different of different groups of Hanukkah songs and yeah. stuff like it was a whole drawer of like yeah. Hanukkah songs yeah <laughs> unbelievable yeah mm-hmm. so all my I'm very proud of that I'm a rabbi who throws things out and paints them mm-hmm. I think it's important it's nice in here right it was moldy in here when I got here oh. really like physically yeah. moldy yeah, this is a great space. I've always right? loved, loved this space. Right. The windows are great in this hall. Even downstairs pretty pretty mm-hmm. light down there, yeah. Yeah. All right. So do you do Did you ever listen fun? to um uh that program on being? You yeah. must listen to Krista yeah, yeah. Tippett. So her last question uh-huh, is always okay. I'm gonna ask you a version of it. Because okay. her last question is do you ever listen to that program? It's a fantastic I listen to that program. Every Sunday on my way to meet my running group, and I always turn it on. And I always think, you know, I'm going to lose interest. I'm not going to. I'm after a couple of minutes, I'll be done listening. To, and it never happens. Uh-huh. I always Get continue listening. Uh-huh. To mm-hmm. She interviews. It's a it's a program about spiritual life, but she interviews everybody from astronomers to psychologists to you know, um, monks to rabbis, and she's had Jonathan Sachs on there. Anyway, she, her last question is, what, some, always like, what, is, what does it mean to be a human being? Huh. Uh, I'm going to ask a, 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 a more winnowed version. What's the, what is the most important thing about Judaism and about the Jewish legacy to you? Wow. What, what, do, you, what, do, you, what, what do you treasure most about, uh-huh. about that? <laughs> <laughs> I think the goal of a Jewish life is to connect heaven and earth. And I think that's a felt experience. It has to do with being even alert or aware of our bodies so that we can feel what's really going on for us. And there's, strangely enough, taking our attention and putting it in all of us. That's what it means to connect heaven and earth. So... um, the meets vote of Judaism, the daily practices remind me that I'm going to stop and eat now, and I'm going to have one of those moments of just stopping and then eat. Mm-hmm. Mostly I forget. Sometimes when I remember, I don't get the connection, and sometimes I get the connection, you know, but that's the goal all the time. We have a good series of practices, uh, of group experiences where we can support each other. Um, if you just stay in a group, if you just stay in a group and say, all, all of us in our hearts, we really understand what our dear friend Shireen is going through now with her heart loss. Our hearts are really open to her. That right there, when everyone feels that at the same time, that's a moment of prayer. That's a moment of connecting heaven and earth because it's felt. And it's felt from our conscious part of our being and our emotional part of our being, and later we're bringing soup over. This is the way of Jewish practice, to get spirit into into earth. So that's what I think it means to be an earthling. Genesis is right. We're made out of God and the planet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, thank you. Is there anything else you feel like... No, I think that's a good power out. I, I'm sticking with that. Okay, that's, that's, why that's a good question. That's why she asks that question at the end, I guess.